Good evening and welcome to this first all virtual Cumberland conversation. It seems a long time ago since our last conversation with Lady Hale. The world has certainly changed in the meantime. Lady Hale is a rather hard act to follow, but we do have the perfect successors today, Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paul Edmondson. Stanley and Paul are two of the world's leading Shakespeare scholars and they're no strangers to Cumberland Lodge. They've been leading our annual Shakespeare study retreat for a number of years, together with Rowan Williams, Sally Vickers, and a host of other wonderful scholars and artists. I'm gonna have a conversation with them for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have 20 minutes for questions. If you have a question, you can use the Q&A function if you're watching live on Zoom or by commenting on your Facebook live stream. At the end, I'm going to make some announcements and you may want to have a pen and a paper handy for those. So just a bit of advance warning on that. Stanley Paul, thank you so much for joining us today from your COVID bubble. And it's great to have you with us. Great to, uh, I'm sorry we can't all be together at Cumberland Lodge, but nevertheless, it's great to have you with us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank it's you great to be here get things going, um, many of us will have studied Shakespeare at school and some of us will have been rather relieved when that came to an end, but clearly that's not the case for, for you two. So perhaps just to set the scene this evening, could you tell us about how you got into Shakespeare and why you decided to devote so much of your lives to studying him? After you, Stanley. Yes, um, well, I'm a grammar school boy. Uh, there were no books in my home, so it wasn't through a paternal influence that I got into Shakespeare. It was through school and through the grammar school, where I had a very inspiring teacher uh, in, the, in, in the fifth and the sixth form. He was called Mr. Large. He had a number of pupils who have risen to fame, one of them is Sir Tom Courtney, the actor, for example. And uh, it was through him, through his readings, his teaching, his own personal reading, he would, he would walk around the classroom with his gown billowing behind him, declaiming Lear or, or Hamlet. And it was through him that I got interested. Uh, I, I remember vividly the sonnet that, that I was first attracted by, number 29, when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes. But also I was able to see Shakespeare, I was able to see Donald Wolfe, the great touring actor, as Othello in other roles. So how about you, Paul? Well, I, I went to um, Huntington Comprehensive School up in York, um, and Shakespeare felt very remote until I was about 14. And then I started to study Macbeth for GCSE, and I found it captivating. I found the way the, our, our teacher, Tricia Ellison, uh, spoke about Macbeth to be arresting, and I wanted to find out more. And I realized, I don't know how, how I discovered it, but I, I discovered that the public library had gramophone discs of Shakespeare plays. And so I took out Macbeth. And that was really a wonderful thing to have done because I just wanted to borrow more Shakespeare plays on gramophone disc from York Public Library. And I do this on a Saturday and cycle into York and cycle back with them, listen to them with my complete works open in front of me, record them onto cassette tape and was building up quite an archive of my own. And, and, and then we came to Stratford with the school to see John Caird's Midsummer Night's Dream. And that was hugely inspiring. We were doing that for, for drama uh, GCSE. And it really took off from there. So I, I, I think looking back, I, I was pursuing an enthusiasm uh, that I I still have, and that I, I I still want to be listening to Shakespeare on gramophone discs <laughs> and seeing the plays performed in the theatre. But it's and, not just, not just pursuing an interest. You've actually both made professions out of this. So, what has what's been the career path for you both? Well, for me, um, I was a school teacher for six years. I, I was I was in the RAF. I was invalided out ignominiously after a few weeks. Uh, I worked in a public library, uh, and then I went to teach in a, in, a, in a school in Hampshire. Uh, and for six 
years, I taught. I taught Shakespeare with great difficulty sometimes, so I did my best with it. But because I, I kept up my interest in Shakespeare, uh, reading, for example, Shakespeare's survey, the annual from Cambridge University Press, which I eventually edited for 19 years, and uh, I, getting a bit bored with teaching, I applied to the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford. Uh, and I offered myself as a volunteer, said, could I perhaps come and help you by perhaps transcribing some documents? The director, Alan Nichol, replied kindly, saying, yes, do. I did. He asked me if I'd like to apply for a scholarship, £250 a year, uh, to, 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 to study for first for an MA and then a PhD. And that was how I got onto the professional ladder there. Eventually, I was appointed uh, a fellow of the Shakespeare Institute. And since then, I've been a university, a university teacher for all my professional life. And I went... I went to Durham University and I realised then I thought I might like to do a higher degree and pursue academia. So I, I came to the Shakespeare Institute, University of Birmingham in Stratford-upon-Avon and was able to win a scholarship um, from the then what was called the British Academy, offer those scholarships um, to do the MA. And I stayed on and managed to scrape enough money together through you know, part-time work at a bookshop uh, for a PhD and then got a bursary from Birmingham. And then I taught in three different universities for a year, uh, Shakespeare at, at Warwick University and Reading University and South Bank University. And then the job came up at the Birthplace Trust for what was then called Head of Education. And I audaciously applied for it. And marvelously, I got it. <laughs> and I, I started working for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust on the 5th of November, 2001. And, uh, you know, God willing, I'm, I'm, I'm still there, um, now, now head of research. And I've just kept teaching Shakespeare, thinking about Shakespeare, writing about Shakespeare, organising Shakespeare to happen in various research projects and, and other enterprises through my job at the Birthplace Trust. And when did your two, um, when, did, when did you collide, as it were? When <laughs> Stanley was my supervisor, but only for, um, only for one term. Because my main, my main supervisor, John Jowett was um, no John, my main supervisor John Jowett was on study leave or something, and that was during my PhD. But you did supervise my MA thesis. I on did, the sonnets. yes, on the yeah. sonnets, yes. Yeah. So, so we were thinking about the sonnets twenty odd years ago yeah. <laughs> together. Well, that's rather neatly takes us on to to what we're really the meat of what we're going to be um, discussing this evening because. Um, you've got a new book out called All the Sonnets of Shakespeare. So mm -hmm. sonnets of Shakespeare have been around for rather a long time. So what's, what is there new to say about the sonnets? Well, lots of new things to say about the sonnets, because one of the things that's happened to these marvellous poems is the same thing has been said about them for about 250 years until now, we hope. Well, we, we, <laughs> we, we feel, well, this is probably, this is true, I think. Yeah. Um, and our book is the first book to put the sonnets into what we believe to be chronological order to show the order in which Shakespeare composed them and to intersperse within that chronology the sonnets from his plays which form parts of dialogue or monologues or epilogues or prologues uh, among the sonnets which were first published in 1609. So from 154 sonnets from the 1609 collection our book has 182 sonnets. That's, yeah. that's one thing to say about its originality. Yes, uh, it, 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 it stresses the, the, the links between uh, Shakespeare's private artistry, because I believe that the sonnets were written primarily for his own private uh, interest and, uh, and enthusiasm as a, as a poet. They weren't published until 1609, and that was long after many of them were written. And his main period of writing sonnets was, in fact, uh, in the early 1590s, which is part of why the, the sonnets within his plays uh, predominate in the, in the earlier plays, like Love's Labour's Lost, for example, which is laden with sonnets and other verse forms, formal, formal verse, the way that typically Shakespeare's earlier plays are written far more formally uh, than the later plays, where his style becomes much freer. So our, our book really breaks with tradition in, in, in a traditional approach to Shakespeare's sonnets and offers something quite new and we've been startled by it haven't we yes what, we have yeah. what this has done to the sonnets because in taking away a very sort of tired narrative about Shakespeare's life which is not there it's been brought to the poems since the 18th century um, we've rather we think we've rather set them free and, yeah. and look and to look at them 
really freshly. Uh, and in doing that, we've we've been struck by the personality of these poems afresh. And what the, and the light that they show on Shakespeare's own personality. We, we started working together on the sonnets as long ago uh, as uh, 2004, Bill, before then, because in 2004, we published a book with Oxford University Press this time called Shakespeare's Sonnets. It's a study of the sonnets, not an edition. It's a study of them. And the seeds of what we're now doing, of what we do in our new book, were, I think it's fair to say, uh, do you lay a seed <laughs> or, or, or <laughs> began to germinate yeah. then? Yeah. But but so so for example, one of the one of the old chestnuts about Shakespeare's sonnets is that the first 126 are all addressed to a, a, a young man, and that the rest are all addressed to um the so-called dark lady. This is not the case, it never has been the case. When you look at the sonnets in terms of to whom they are addressed or to what they are addressed, you find that only 121 of them are addressed to people. And it is quite a lot of them are not addressed to anybody. Eight, eight, <laughs> eight, eight, so eight, 84 of them could be either to a male or a female. Um, far fewer are only to a male or only to a female than, 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 than people have supposed. 25 are personal meditations. Yeah, yeah. Six are addressed to abstract concepts and two are translations. This has never been set forth before it's in very, quite that way. No, no, it's a very varied collection of poems. But Shakespeare's writing them over about 30 years. And you you also say that he, he wrote them in bursts, is that right? He had particular periods when he, he clearly was writing a lot of them and then stopped for a bit and then started again? Yes, I think that's true. Uh, some of them fall into groups. One of the things that we do in our book is to point out which of them are in groups, uh, enabling the reader to see which, which are, for example, the very first 17 published in the 69 collection are all uh, addressed to, to a young male person, a fair, fair youth, a beautiful boy, urging him to marry. So that is a little subset within the, within the collection. There are other smaller uh, linked sonnets, sometimes grammatically linked, and we point this out in our, in, in our notes when, when uh, we have tables uh, showing the links, uh, the, the thematic and the grammatical links among individual sonnets too. Uh, you know, we notice, for example, there are 19 pairs. So on 19 occasions, Shakespeare wrote a sonnet then wrote a sequel to it. Some of them are quite formal sonnets. One of them, for example, as we show, is addressed uh, to, uh, so, to, to somebody while, while giving him a book. In fact, this was only shown last year, wasn't it, Paul? That, that I've forgotten what's the name. Adam, Adam Barker from the, the Shakespeare yeah. Institute, a student there, um, published a note um, uh, showing that uh, one of the sonnets is actually a letter accompanying uh, the gift of an almanac. Um, now, previously it had been thought to be a notebook, but Adam showed very clearly that it was uh, an almanac. And two, actually two of the sonnets are what we might think of as, as letters. Um, so that that changes, that that's revealing, isn't it, about the the, the different kinds of poetry and yep. different genres that are at work within this form for Shakespeare. Uh, so it's not the case that he's setting out to write a sequence at all. Not at all. And, yeah. and, and you ask when he wrote them, well, yes, you know, there are bursts, but, you know, it, poets seem always to be revising their work and sometimes over many years, as, as there's evidence that Shakespeare did that, of course, as well. And how did you actually determine the, the chronology? We rely on other people primarily for that. Uh, that there is a, a, a distinguished scholar in, Australia, in New Zealand, isn't he? Uh, Mac Jackson, MacDonald P. Jackson, who over quite a long period now has worked on the chronology. And we, we, we've followed his work as reported primarily in the New Oxford edition of Shakespeare. Uh, it depends mainly on, on links between the plays and the poems, on verbal links. Uh, it's interesting that, for to give you just one example, one of the passages we talk about in the introduction is a lovely passage from Edward III, very little known play and a little known passage. 
in the Shakespearean portion of that play, it's a collaborative play, Shakespeare actually portrays somebody, a king, asking his servant to help him to write a love sonnet, to try to seduce a woman that he's, uh, well, he wants to seduce. He doesn't get very far either with this sonnet or with the woman, but uh, that's an interesting. And there are verbal links between that play. For example, there's a whole line uh, what is it, Paul? Um, Lilies at Vesta Lil smell Lilies, far worse than weeds. Which occurs both in the play Edward the Third and uh, as the a, in one of the sonnets, as the last line of the sonnets. So there are intimate relationships between the sonnets and the plays at the same time. And the sonnets are so varied in their in their purpose. I mean, one of them is a religious meditation, for example. Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth. One, four, six. Shakespeare's only, I would say, his only explicitly religious poem, except perhaps for the, the Phoenix and the Turtle, published later. So, and, and of course, in Sally's mentioned loves, um, Edward III, but in Love's Labour's Lost, the, the Lords are having a basically a sonnet writing competition yeah. in that play. Uh, Romeo and Juliet speak a sonnet famously. They share a sonnet when they first meet and fall in love at first sight. Um, and Beatrice and Benedict in Much Do About Nothing. Benedict is trying to write uh, a sonnet in praise of Beatrice. We never actually hear it, but they've they both written sonnets for each other. And one of the uh, requirements of the action of the play is to see them read each other's sonnets, but we don't hear them <laughs> at the end of the play. <laughs> It is interesting that Shakespeare is writing a lot of his sonnets at the time when the sonnet was a very popular form among English poets. Right. It's, it enjoyed a, a sudden burst of popularity from 1591 when Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Stella was posthumously published. And then I think it's 19 sequences of sonnets followed between that, 1591 and 1597. And in a way that's done Shakespeare a disservice because it's led people to assume that he was trying to write a sequence too. They're all much shorter than the Shakespeare collection. Uh, uh, and Shakespeare is a far more diverse, far more varied. But people have lazily assumed, I think, that the 1609 collection was Shakespeare's attempt to do what other people had done in the early 1590s, which it wasn't. It doesn't have that sort of unity, that sort of uh, single aim. And absolutely, and the chronological approach ex explodes all of that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you're you saying that. The sonnets were a popular form, other people were writing them. Obviously, we're going to come on later to some of the issues about questions about uh, Shakespeare's authorship of a certain thing. There's no doubt whatsoever that, that he is the author of all these sonnets. No, no doubt whatever, no. Good. <laughs> no reason to doubt it, no reason to suppose they were published under his name. In 1609, the volume says, Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted. It doesn't say William Shakespeare sonnets. It's a third person title page, which implies that Shakespeare himself was not the originator of, 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 the, of the publication process. And my own belief is that Shakespeare didn't particularly want these sonnets to be published, perhaps in his own lifetime at least. It is in that John Donne, his great contemporary, his songs and sonnets, uh, which includes some of the greatest poems, some of the greatest religious poems in the English language. Uh, his poems were published posthumously in uh, 1630, 31 or 33. Um, uh, and I, I think Shakespeare would have been perfectly happy for his sonnets to have been published uh, after, he, after his death. We think, we think, having looked at them as closely as we have for a long time now, that Shakespeare didn't want these poems published. Mm. But, Somehow, as a, as some, a group, so, as a, so, somehow they the manuscript fell into hands that you know he didn't he didn't want it to appear especially. They're so too they're very, personal. They're, no, so they're, they're too personal. They're too they're too laden with emotion, uh, yeah. personal painful emotion and 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 sexuality for them to be public poems. These yeah. Daniel. So they're private. They're personal. So what do they tell us about Shakespeare as a result of being so personal? Well, you know, the sonnets express very difficult feelings, may, nearly, all, nearly always to do with love or lust or desire or attraction. Um, and you can read a Shakespeare sonnet and some of them are very difficult. Let's not, let's not pretend otherwise. Yeah. We, and you really can struggle with them. And you think, is he really saying that? Is he really saying that I, 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 I wish I, I was rather dead than, than see you go with somebody else or whatever? And, and yes, he is. He is saying that. And, and they take us to 
um, expressions of jealousy, and uh, some of them are about sleeplessness, about sexual obsession. Lust. Lust. 129. I can't think of a single poem about lust in the period, uh, a sonnet, I mean, other than Shakespeare's sonnet 129. So they are um, uh, very powerful and personal. And as, as I mentioned earlier, 25 of them are, are not addressed, are, are, are meditations. You know, they, they really seem to be Shakespeare thinking something through. And writing from a personal situation of love, of, of divided love, in one case at least, two loves I have of comfort and despair, he says. And the comfort and despair refer to the objects of his love, one of them a man and the other a woman. They show us that Shakespeare went through a, a bisexual uh, stage of his life. At that, least. That's Sonnet 144. And then there are two other, what, what we might call love triangles in the sonnets, um, Sonnets 40 to 42 and sonnets 133 to 134 are also about love triangles, not necessarily with the same man and woman no, as, no. who are mentioned in 144, could be different people. That's one of the fallacies that we have to try to combat, the idea that they're all about the same people. And of course, the people are unidentifiable. We can't say who are the people with whom Shakespeare was uh, entangled. Uh, the only person we know about, of course, is his wife. And but we can, we can tell their ages sometimes because he talks about um, yeah. sweet boy or lovely yeah. boy, yeah. Um, or he uses the more formalised version of, of the uh, second person, you, or, with, or is it thou, depending on... On, on, to whom they are addressed. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, it's so many of them are famous because they're lyrical and they are exquisitely beautiful. And those are the sonnets that, as it were, everybody knows. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes? Um, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. These are these are the sonnet's greatest hits. And of course, they're some of the greatest poems in the English language. But for all of those greatest hits, there are many more that are really tough edged and knotty and difficult. Yeah, and it's partly because of the, the difficulty of them that we, in our edition, we, we provide not only explanatory notes uh, in, in the way it is customary in addition to Shakespeare, but we also provide paraphrases of every sonnet. At the end of the book, we we have pro, a prose, a full prose paraphrase of, e of each sonnet. They were quite difficult to do, weren't they? <laughs> they were. So I remember the day, Ed, when Stanley looked at me and just shook his head. He said, these are such difficult poems because our collaboration meant that we were taking care of half the poems each, producing notes on them, you know, producing the addition of each sonnet, sharing these with each other, changing them, revising them, suggesting different things and so on. And you said one day, these are such difficult poems. And I said, Stanley, if you and I think these are difficult, what about our readers? And the more we looked at other editions of these poems, the more they don't explain what the poems mean. They gloss individual words and they, they compare those words to other parts of Shakespeare's canon, but they don't really tell you if you're struggling with a line, what it actually means. And we, we were determined to give our readers as much help as possible. So we decided that we were going to produce paraphrases at the back of the book. And there are 182 um, literal prose paraphrases of every sonnet. So uh, people can kick against them. They can write their own paraphrases. They can disagree with them, but we wanted to convey the oddness of Shakespeare's phrasing in the poems through the way we wrote the paraphrases. Yes. So they're, de they're deliberately sort of unsmooth, slightly awkwardly um, edged yeah, yeah, yeah. because of the nature of the poems themselves. Yeah. So well, to read several paraphrases at once probably gives you a sense of how Shakespeare thought, the, 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 the direction of his thinking. We'll come back to the sonnets in a bit, but I want to take the conversation in a slightly di different direction now because that's not the first book, and we already know that it's not the first book you've worked on together. You've, you've produced uh, several books. Two of them I just want to pick out. One um, is the Shakespeare Circle, an alternative biography, and the other yes. is Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, Evidence, Argument, and Controversy. And let's just start with the, oh, there they are. Well, like, as if by magic, there we go. <laughs> so um, let's start with Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. Why, why did you write um, this book? Well, so this, this was very much a Shakespeare birthplace trust centred project, as indeed is the Shakespeare Circle. So the fact that we've collaborated sort of arises out of our, 
our work commitments, our, our dedication to um, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. And people who teach Shakespeare all over the world will know that a question that often comes up from their students is, did Shakespeare really write the plays attributed to him? And the Birthplace Trust has been asked this question you know, many, many times. Um, and we decided because of what turned out to be uh, quite an awful film by Roland Emmerich called Anonymous back in 2011, we used that film as a catalyst to really lock antlers with this question for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. And we called it the Shakespeare Authorship Campaign. And it had three prongs. One was Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, which is a collection of essays by Shakespeareans in response to the Shakespeare authorship discussion. Um, and it's, it's kind of cultural effect as well as where did it start from and uh, who else is being nominated apart from the man himself. Um, and one was an online campaign called 60 Minutes with Shakespeare, which is still there, 60 voices talking for 60 minutes, for a minute each. Um, uh, so you can have an hour, as it were, including Dame Harriet Walter and uh, Prince Charles himself Stephen did Fry. one of them, Stephen Fry did one and so on. That's still there, 60 Minutes with Shakespeare.com. And an ebook we produced of 7,000 words, a polemical essay um, called Shakespeare Bites Back, shakespearebitesback.com, and that's still there. And um, friends around the world who teach Shakespeare say, when that question comes up, I, I, I tell my students to go away and read shakespearebitesback.com. And if they have any questions after having read that essay, to come back and ask them, and they never come back and ask, which is reassuring. <laughs> Yeah, I also wrote a, a, a book which was a Kindle, uh, which, which is online uh, called who, "Who Was Who Was William Shakespeare." Uh, we really got worked up during that, that that period we about did. it all, There's and we had a lot of incentive, and we had we we we, we had opposition, oh, uh, uh, particularly from a man called Alexander War, uh, who is the, uh, the the grandson of the great Evelyn War. And Alexander War was really quite vicious in his opposition. He conducted a complete campaign against the birthplace, uh, including what, what was the title of his ebook? I'm not going. I'm not going to mention it. People can find it for themselves. <laughs> yeah. uh, but 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 it was the, quite the, similar to people, your book with with a, with a question mark at the end. Suffice, of suffice, suffice to say, um, there's a lot of heat in that debate. Yeah, yeah. We think we've moved the um, discussion on rather. And it, it, yes, because, you know, it, 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 we feel that we have done some good there and made some progress. Because um, in our book, we got a, a, a number of writers to write about different aspects uh, of Shakespeare, polemically to some degree, mm. but from the point of view of uh, of, of disproving the the, the, the fallacious ideas that there was any any reason to question William Shakespeare as von Avon's authorship of the plays and poems uh, attributed to him. And, in, in, before, and before you start suggesting any other nominee, you have to disprove all of the different pieces of evidence, and there are many, in Shakespeare's favour. Don't just say, oh, none of it's um, uh, good enough. That, that's a nonsense. You don't treat any evidence in that way. You have to go through every single piece disprove it and then tell me um who 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 an alternative theory uh, but but you'll find time and again it's happening right now people just say oh, it can't have been it shouldn't have been it couldn't have been well that that's no approach to anything it, it smacks of conspiracy theory and it smacks of uh, inferiority complex but shakespeare clearly he drew on lots of sources that he's been yeah. so all writers do absolutely because i think that the, the the comedy series Upstart Crow that that was a that was used as a bit of an insult to, to him was it not and uh, it, well they, they, it was originally when he when, when he was first referred to in 1592 as an Upstart Crow you know one of the things I really like about the Upstart Crow apart from the fact that it's putatively set in Shakespeare's birthplace as it were on Henley Street is that it reminds us of Shakespeare as a collaborator and one of the things that puts paid to any alternative nominee is the minute you admit and we do and have done for decades that Shakespeare collaborated occasionally with other authors, well, you can't keep anything a secret once you start collaborating. You know, so the idea that it wasn't one man and it was therefore somebody else is just not the right place to start from in any case, um, because people worked together in those days and Shakespeare uh, also uh, collaborated. So, so that, that, that complicates things for a start if you're going to start offering alternative nominees. We start, I mean, obviously, you, you sort of think of Shakespeare as this individual, but Shakespeare's got a whole range of people around him that are influencing him. You wrote another, we well, edited a book 
called the Shakespeare Circle. And I wonder what, um, what you discovered about Shakespeare that you didn't already know uh, when you c brought this collection together. Well, that was the, that, that, that it, was, it was the desire to do that, that it was the incentive to, to organizing uh, and commissioning that book. We thought it would be interesting to see Shakespeare, to try to see Shakespeare from the point of view of people who knew him, so that we have essays in, in that book about, for example, all the people who are mentioned in his will, we have a, a section on the will, about his children, about his relatives, his known relatives, uh, who have been under-investigated in most biographies of Shakespeare. So we thought that was a, a sort of alternative biography of Shakespeare. Yes, yeah, it's, it's subtitled Alternative Biography, and it was, as it were, the people, who, the people in his life uh, with whom we know he was closest, um, they were the focus of that book. And they're all they're all taken by by different writers. Yes, it's a multi-authored collection. Yeah. We got a number of specialists in in on people like Marlowe or or or, 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 or author of the, the Will and 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 the, the daughters Shakespeare's daughters, his granddaughter, very interesting granddaughter he had. Uh, they, it, it means they, it means that you know, book about Shakespeare, you're suddenly looking at different kinds of social contexts and mm. connections. Yeah, the people who are only in the margins of conventional biographies of Shakespeare, the spotlight is turned outwards onto some of the people who, who, who knew him, who knew him best. Stanley, related. do you remember how, how much fun we had? We, we wrote imaginary monologues oh, we for, did. for the yeah. people in the, in the Shakespeare circle. Again, this was a, birth, a birthplace trust connected project. So all of the monologues are still there online with different, different speakers. We've got various people to record them. And we, we imagined, for example, Shakespeare's daughters speaking and his son Hamnet. Just and two or three minute little actors little from the company. Yeah. And, then, and then people gave voice to them and recorded them. And people can find those freely available on Shakespeare, the shakespearecircle.com will take you to it to, via the Birthplace Trust website. Yeah. Are, are there particular people you'd say had really strong influences on him? Oh, well, I think... I think, you know, all of the people in the Shakespeare circle are there because of the influence they had on Shakespeare and his, the closeness uh, to him. I, but I'm thinking especially of the playwrights. Yeah. Like Ben Jonson, for example, and how... Marlowe, certainly. Yeah. He, I think he probably knew Marlowe personally. And Marlowe certainly is an influence on, on, on the early plays and probably on the poems too. And John Fletcher, uh, with whom he later, in, later in life. You see, Shakespeare, it's interesting, Shakespeare's career divides into, well, you could divide it easily into three parts. The first part, about which we know least, when he is collaborating with uh, people, this has become increasingly uh, evident in, in, as a result of recent studies. Uh, that, that he was collaborating sometimes with, perhaps with Thomas Kidd, for example, or George Peel on Titus Andronicus. Then in 1594, when he's 30 years old, he, he becomes uh, the, the, the lead playwright for a, uh, for a company, which becomes the Lord Chamberlain's men. And for the next uh, 10 or more years, he writes solo authored plays. And then towards the end of his life, and we don't know exactly why, he starts collaborating first with Thomas Middleton on Time and of Athens, uh, and uh, later with John Fletcher on uh, The Two Noble Kinsmen, and on the play known as Henry VIII, which was originally called All is True. So uh, were those men may even have been sort of apprentices to Shakespeare, whom he was encouraging. Of course, the other people who had an influence on him were the actors for whom he was writing. Yeah. So there's, there's a marvellous chapter in the book, I'm just looking at it, um, about Richard Burbage and the Burbages by John Astington from Toronto and Bart Van Ness in Oxford has written about the actors Will Kemp, Robert Armin and other members of Shakespeare's company. These are the influences professionally. And then we've got the personal influences yeah. in terms of Michael Wood, the television historian and scholar, has produced a lovely essay about his mother and, and that whole background of, 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 of the... the um, the, the country world that she was associated with, the traditional Roman Catholic world, the telling stories to children and the kinds of stories Shakespeare would have been told, um, you know, from a very early age. So yeah. that, that's the sort of thing that the book allowed us to encourage, yeah. uh, to, to put circles around Shakespeare, to think about um, connecting circles. So it's a, it's, it's a metaphor in that sense, as well as a, obviously a social network. Sadly, I'm intrigued that there's someone peering over your shoulder from oh. behind. And I just wondered, is this someone in... Uh, That's a portrait of Nicholas Rowe. Uh, Nicholas Rowe, the, the early 18th century, uh, 
editor and biographer of Shakespeare. I bought it quite a long time ago, uh, partly because Rowe may be regarded as a sort of intellectual ancestor of mine. Uh, Rowe was the first editor, the first biographer of Shakespeare, and I am an editor and a biographer of Shakespeare. It's by Godfrey Nell, or to be strictly accurate, it's what they call school of Godfrey Nell, <laughs> which means that I gather that part of the, probably the face was published by Nella and the rest finished by members of the studio. But I see portraits behind you, Ed, too. Yeah, indeed. So we've got Nella behind me as well. So we, we share something in common, but uh, there we are. That, but I don't own it. It's, uh, it's Cumberland Lodges, but uh, there we go. Now, um, we, we need to draw uh, to a close, but just a couple of things I want to ask you before um, we uh, go over to some of the questions that have come in. Um, first of all, just get a, you're both very involved in the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. And for those of people who are not familiar with it, do you just tell us a bit about uh, what you do? Well, so the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust uh, came into being from the middle of the 19th century. Um, when public monies were gathered to purchase Shakespeare's birthplace to stop it from falling into private hands. And monies were collected as people visited the house and other houses were purchased over many decades relating to Shakespeare's family. So there's a network of five Shakespeare related houses that the trust presents, looks after, curates and cares for and makes available. Um, and then we have uh, alongside that uh, uh, an, uh, an organically um, uh, founded and, and growing library, archive and museum collection from the middle of the 19th century onwards, very important. A significant, important collection. It was half of the original documents relating to Shakespeare, for example. Uh, and, the, and it charts the, the genesis and the evolution of Stratford as a market town from the 12th century to the present day. Uh, it's on the UNESCO list for world memory. Um, and then we have an education programme as well, um, which is uh, online and uh, in, in non-COVID times, um, actual in Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, so that's what we do. And I'm head of research. And Stanley, you I were started chair... off as a trustee. And then you were chairman for 20 years. And then I became chairman yeah. for nearly 20 years, chairman of the trust. And then, uh, then uh, at the instigation, I'm glad to say, of our great friend, who sadly died recently, a great friend of Cumberland Lodge too, Sir Eric Anderson, uh, who was one of our trustees, suggested very kindly that I might be uh, nominated as what they call the honorary president of the Shakespeare Birth Press Trust. So that's my current position. Of course, I have an office there, but of course, I haven't been able to get into it since March because of the current situation. It was Eric's way, I think, of, well, it was Eric's way of making sure that the Birthplace Trust held on to Stanley by creating the post of honorary president for him. So Stanley is the first ever honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Well, Eric was a very wise man, so clearly... Indeed he was, yeah. 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 And then just to, before we, we move to, to the questions that have come in, um, we've talked a lot about sonnets. Would you like to, to uh, both read a sonnet for us just, and just say why you've chosen those particular sonnets? Um, I've chosen one, it's sonnet, it's sonnet 23. And we believe this to have been composed around about 1595 to 97. It's about um, an actor, so it's very much engrafted with Shakespeare's own personality. As an unperfect actor on the stage, who with his fear is put besides his part, or some fierce thing replete with too much rage, whose strength's abundance weakens his own heart, so I, for fear of trust, forget to say the perfect ceremony of love's rite, and in mine own love's strength seem to decay or charged with burden of mine own love's might. Oh, let my books be then the eloquence and dumb presages of my speaking breast, who plead for love and look for recompense more than that tongue that, that more hath more expressed. Oh, learn to read what silent love hath writ, to hear with eyes belongs to love's fine wit. So it ends up being a sonnet really about, I can't express how I feel about you in words. So look between the words, listen between the words, um, learn to read, what to hear with eyes. So look at the gaps between the words and hear the silence. And that's how much I'm trying to express my love for you. But it starts with it being like an actor who just forgets everything on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Well, I think I ought to read a sonnet from, from, from one of the plays, as, as part of a feature of our book, is it's interspersing the sonnets from the plays among the, 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 the printed, sonnets, the published sonnets. So let me read one from Love's Labour's Loss. Love's Labour's Loss, the most artificial, the most full of artifice of all Shakespeare's plays. And therefore, when I, was, when I used to teach Shakespeare, I would tell students that Love's Labour's Lost was the last play to read first, uh, because it's, it's the most difficult to read. It's a lovely, wonderful play, however, to see it, if you see it well done, because it has such verve, such, such clever manipulation of comic situations. So here is the central character of the play, Baroon, talking about, about love. Study me how to please the eye indeed by fixing it upon a fairer eye, who dazzling so that eye shall be his heed and give him light that it was blunted by. Blinded by, sorry. Study is like the heaven's glorious sun. He really gets into his stride now. Study is like the heaven's glorious sun that will not be deep searched with saucy looks. Swall have continual plodders ever one, save base authority from others' books. Those earthly godfathers of heaven's lights that give a name to every fixed star have no more profit of their shining nights than those that walk and what not what they are. Too much to know is to know naught but fame, and every godfather can give a name. <laughs> it's a witty, <laughs> elegant piece of writing, isn't it? Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's move on now to some of the questions that have come in. And um, Sally Moss has asked, has asked this. So even though we've said categorically that the sonnets uh, all go down to Shakespeare, she says, do you think Mary Sidney wrote any of the sonnets? No, <laughs> certainly not, no. I mean, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're finding echoes of other poets in Shakespeare's sonnets, then that shouldn't surprise us. Yeah. Perhaps, do, um, could you just expand a little bit, a bit on, on, on that? Because uh, for the, why that might be a question, why, why Mary Sidney might be uh, thought of as possible. Well, she she wrote many fine poems in her own right, didn't she? And 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 she and, and famously, she and her her brother produced their own very lyrical, very beautiful versions of of all of the psalms. But there's no reason to suppose that she wrote Shakespeare's sonnets. There, there they are. Well, Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted. Oh, good out. Then we had a question here from um, Richard a um, Abramson, who has said in several of the sonnets. Shakespeare implies that his work will last forever, will immortalize the subjects. For example, Sonnet 65. Was this particular to him amongst poets? Did he actually hold that his work would so long outlast him? It was a, a Renaissance trope to um, emblazon the lover with, with, with a sense of eternity through comparing the lover to the, to, to the nature of the verse. Um, and Shakespeare does this time and again in the sonnets, and he's finding, you know, one of the great pleasures of reading all of them all at once is, is to, to, to see how he finds new ways of convincing the reader and the, and the addressee that their love will last forever, that they will somehow be immortalized in his lines. He find, he's very original in his expression of it. Um, my favorite example is, I think, is Sonnet 81, which ends with, you still shall live, such virtue hath my pen where breath most breathes, even in the mouths of men. So the fact that you've spoken those lines, Shakespeare's saying, my addressee, my, my, the, the lover, is momentarily present in your very mouth, in your breath, just by having spoken those lines that I've just made you read. <laughs> Cute. We have a question here from Nick Beaker. And uh, Nick has asked, uh, as almost all of Shakespeare's work was written for performance, and provides such a vivid oral experience. How do you feel the language of his sonnets differs from that of his plays? Does their intimacy lend itself more to silent private reading than to recital? That's an interesting suggestion. I think one thing first to say is that the, son the sonnets are very varied. Some of them are more rhetorical than others. Some of them are poems that are, they're easy to read aloud, that almost seem to demand being read aloud. Others, however, very much interior monologues. So I think the variety is an important feature. What about you, Paul? Do you... I, I, think, I think that um, there is a difference in register between, as let's say, if we can be generalizing 
um, between a play sonnet yeah. and a 1609 collection sonnet. And the 1609 ones just feel more personal, more private on the whole. On the whole but as yeah. Stanley says, that's not that doesn't apply at all to all of them. Um, they are more difficult, therefore, to read as poems than the sonnet moments in the plays. Why? Because they are private, they are introverted, and they are so compact with thought, some of them, yeah. that they do require careful study and uh, focus in order properly to, as it were, tease out their meaning. Yeah, it is a very interesting question. Though. It's something I should like to, to do more work on, to think more about the, 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 the difference in styles between the sonnets that Shakespeare writes to be read and those that he writes to be performed. I mean, the ones that he's writing to be performed, it's difficult to generalise about those, but they, they come at moments of crisis or moments of self-revelation for the character or... Um, the, for example, the epic and or or, or plot, interiority sometimes. or interiority like Cressida or... and and Beatrice when she overhears how much um, Benedict apparently loves her and the formal ones too like the the, the prologues to to two choruses to Romeo and Juliet for example uh, and Henry V has a sonnet as one of its uh, as, a, as an epilogue an epilogue yeah, yeah. very varied poems so plenty to chew on that question. Um, we have a question here from uh, Andrew Taylor, who's asked, uh, a dramatist is necessarily investigating his characters and to some extent hiding behind them. Are the sonnets more dramatic poems or do we see Shakespeare here stepping out from behind his characters and expressing his own feelings directly? And could you say a little more about your belief that he was unwilling to see them published? Thank you, Andrew. So um, we're not when we're, we're not saying that all of the poems in the 1609 collection are, as it were, direct expressions of Shakespeare's personality, because he's writing them on so many diverse occasions over yeah. 30 years. But there are some. So, for example, 136 ends with the line ends, ends with the words for my name is Will. Right. So he's putting his own name into that particular sonnet and several of the other sonnets pun on his first name. So this must give us reason to pause, to think these poems, some of them, many of them have Shakespeare's DNA shot through them. And what are we going to do with that? Yes. Uh, as for why he didn't, we think he didn't want to be published, it's partly because uh, they weren't published uh, until a long time after most of them were written. There's no question about that. Uh, two of them appeared in print in a surreptitious publication in, in 1599 uh, called The Passionate Pilgrim in slightly different versions from those. Uh, and there's reason to believe that, that, that Shakespeare didn't want them to be published there, that he protested indeed about it, as was later said, when that volume went into a second edition. Uh, so, uh, and then, you, as I said before, the volume that eventually appears is Shakespeare's sonnets, his sonnets, and the dedication is not written by Shakespeare, but by the publisher, T.T. Thomas Thorpe, dedicated him to the mysterious Mr. or Master W.H., and we have no idea who that is anymore than everybody else has. Uh, so I, th I, I think if Shakespeare had wanted to have the sonnets published, he could have done. He was influential enough uh, in the publishing world, uh, and, and publishers would have, would have, would have, would have, jumped at the, uh, the possibility, I think. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, carry, carry after on. You. Well, no, carry on. I was going to say, it's our hope that the next biographer of Shakespeare will look at the edition of the sonnets that we've produced and, and realise that rather than tell the same old story, which has been told for 255, 250 odd years, actually, there's a far more interesting, more personal story to tell by looking at these poems afresh. So just to give a tiny example, Ed, sonnets 50 and 51 are a pair of sonnets mm. which are written from somebody on horseback. Shakespeare regularly commuted, commuted between Stratford and London. And, you know, that, that that's suddenly becomes very interesting when you remove the, as it were, uh, predetermined traditional story and think about these poems as, as far closer to Shakespeare's own world and life. Yeah, it gives you, a, 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 you can actually see him complaining about the, the, th the thigh about the, the 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 way that the horses uh, the, the the journey on the horseback r rubbed against his thighs and the way that he has to spur his horse on and, and, and draw blood from the horse isn't it the little little insights like that which perhaps haven't been made made enough of 
I, I want, I'd like to write a piece sometime about what do the sonnets tell us about Shakespeare, quite simply. I felt I'd done so more or less, more or more than once, but, but I think they do tell us quite a lot that isn't always, uh, it doesn't always get into the biographies. Now we have two, two people have, have uh, submitted a very similar question, uh, Vanessa Whitburn and an anonymous uh, attendee. And the question is, do you have any views on how Shakespeare's sonnets can be brought alive to a new generation? And which sonnet would you choose to introduce to GCSE students? Well, that's a lovely question, Vanessa. Thank you. I think I'll plump for, um, oh, there are several that pop into my head. Uh, sonnet 129 about lust might be quite um, appropriate because it's so breathless and it's so extraordinary. And it's a single sentence for... Uh, 12 lines and then the pause uh, before the, uh, the the couplet um, about what lust feels like and then and then sonnet 130 my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun the following sonnet those two sonnets I think would get you quite a long way with with UCSE students because one the second one is it can be so visual you know um my uh, coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Um, and so you could have great fun with those. Yeah, it's, it's a, that a last one, reasons. that second one is a comic poem. And that's not always realised. I've heard distinguished actors read that poem as if it was a solemn poem about my mistress eyes and nothing like the sun. But in fact, it's, 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 it's parodying the, the conventions, the Petrarchan conventions are, are writing about, about, about women. But both of them utterly demonstrate Shakespeare's genius in different ways. Yes, his virtuosity. You know, his, 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 his absolute justification for us to think about him as the greatest writer of English sonnets who've, who's ever lived. Do you think that using the sonnets for school is a good way of getting people into Shakespeare, getting youngsters into Shakespeare? Yes, because they're short, you know, and, and you, can, you can feel that you can possess them quite quickly. Um, Stanley, you remember at your school days, Sonnet 29, you mentioned earlier. Yes, yes, that was um, for what I've... Yeah. yeah. And John Barton, the great director, used sonnets very frequently. Uh, if you watch his wonderful uh, television series playing Shakespeare, you'll see him using sonnets and, uh, as, as methods of training actors. Uh, but but on, the, on, the, on the other hand, they shouldn't be taken as if they were somehow failed speeches from plays. Certainly could be in plays, but they are, they're, they're, they're independent works, uh, useful for training an actor perhaps, but not to be regarded as simply no. sketches. It's, it's, more, it's more interesting than sketches. I mean, yeah. we actually point to 32 of the 182, uh, 154 sites from 1609 as being as creatively reminding us of characters in Shakespeare's plays. That's not to say, um, you know, they're, they're failed speeches. They're failed speeches. Plays, yeah. It just means that these are the mind of the same person who wrote these characters, you know, that you can see connections between them. We're running out of time. We've probably only got time for one more question, but we have a question here from Max Thomas. Um, and Max has asked, what thoughts do you have about the contested authority of a lover's complaint. Are you persuaded by arguments that it is apocryphal? If not, how does Shakespeare's writing a female uh, complaint poem of the kind with which, is, with which it was conventional to close sonnet sequences sit with your argument that Shakespeare never meant for his sonnets to be published and indeed never meant to write a conventional Elizabethan sonnet sequence? I hope I've well, the thank you very much. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very, very lovely question. I think um, the first thing to say is well, they're, they're separate projects. Yeah. They appeared in the same volume and the apocryphal word, the word apocryphal was used because a lover's complaint has been attributed to uh, another writer. Um, I happen to believe it, it's by Shakespeare. As indeed it is claimed to be in the volume, it, it actually says it has a separate title with attribution to William Shakespeare. And we, we have a chapter on this in our 2004 book about Lover's Complaint. Um, but we, we, for this particular project, of course, we were interested in the sonnets only. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely narrative poem, Lover's Complaint. It can be, as I've done myself, creatively linked it to um, themes and ideas and uh, moments in Shakespeare's sonnets. So it, it, it can be read very productively as, as John Kerrigan does in his fine Penguin edition uh, with, with, with Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, but I, I don't think that, um, 
I don't see it as particular. Detracts us from thinking about the sonnet separately. No, no, I don't think not at all. No, it's, it's an appendage in that in the in the sixteen nine volume. But it is, I don't I see no reason to disbelieve the attribution to Shakespeare. There's one more. There's time for one more question, and uh, from anonymous. And uh, you have mentioned that many of the sonnets are meditative and deeply personal. In light of this, should we consider Shakespeare himself as his main? And potentially only audience. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thought. Yes, in some ways, yes. Uh, the sonnets, some of the sonnets, are Shakespeare talking to himself, uh, very intimately, very, very, very profoundly. Med med meditations. Uh, some of them, however, are more outward looking, like, for example, the one we mentioned earlier, which is a letter uh, written to, to, to accompany a gift. We'd love to know who the gift was for. I suspect it might have been the Earl of Southampton, but I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> uh, no, a biographical suggestion like that. So, yeah, they're, they're so varied, though, it's impossible to generalize about them, I think. Well, the, the sonnet I read earlier, 23, is a meditation, it wasn't addressed to anybody. Um, As is the religious one that I mentioned, one, four, five, is it? Uh, yeah. Poor soul, the centre of my sinful earth. Well, I think that that's precisely the kind of reason why we think these, they, you know, they're, 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 they're so personally inflected. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, maybe some of the personal poetry is written primarily for the author's own yes, interests, I indeed, would say, yeah. and still is. And, and for his own, to try to work out for himself the de the deeply personal, intimate situations in which he finds himself, to try to, to, to think, think through the emotional problems that he's having. Shakespeare, in that way, he's as personal as John Donne is, or as some uh, modern poet like, like Tom Gunn, for example, also writing sonnets and writing them in order to work out a, a difficult emotional situation in which the poet finds him or herself. And those those two I mentioned a moment ago for GCSE students, one, two, nine, and one hundred and thirty. They're both meditations. You know, they they really let our own imagination into alongside Shakespeare's. Thank you. We haven't got any time for uh, any more questions, but there are three announcements I want to make and did suggest at the beginning people got a pen and paper handy. So if you've got your pen and paper handy, uh, you may want to make a note of these three things. The first note is that if you'd like to get a, a signed copy of all the sonnets of Shakespeare with, I believe, a special book plate, is that correct? That's right, yes. Then you can do this through the Cambridge University Press bookshop. Um, and the one of the easiest ways to do that is actually to phone the bookshop up. So their telephone number is 01223 333 333. That's 01223 333 333. And I guess, too, if you Google or whatever you use, uh, browser you use, uh, Cambridge University Press Bookshop, you will you will get through. Is that that's correct? Is it? That's right. And they, you can buy it online as well. But some people might prefer just to phone them up and say, please, price. please post me. It's, it's $12.99, um, the book. And a very pretty book. <laughs> we, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press have done us proud with this book. It's a, yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. object in a certain right. Yeah. Now, the second announcement is that Cumberland Lodge um, is organising three study retreats about books um, led by their authors. Sally Vickers has kindly agreed to lead one. I'll be leading another. And then tomorrow at, uh, from nine o'clock in the morning, we'll start taking bookings for the first retreat, which COVID permitting will take place on the 16th to 19th of February. And I'm delighted to say that the book that we'll be exploring is all the sonnets of Shakespeare and the authors Paul and Stanley will be leading the retreat. Now, because of social distancing, we can only offer about 20 places uh, for this, so do get in fast. If you want to find out more about the retreat, then uh, go onto the Cumberland Lodge website uh, with our forthcoming events. You'll find information has been put up today about the retreat. But if you want to reserve a place, then get in touch with Cumberland Lodge tomorrow uh, morning and uh, hopefully you will be able to sign up for that. 
The third thing I wanted to uh, mention before we end is that this is a Cumberland Lodge conversation, but we also run other events as well. We're running a monthly series of webinars called Dialogue and Debate, and they're about contemporary issues and issues relating to the sort of work we do more broadly on social cohesion uh, within the Lodge. Next, uh, the next webinar in the series takes place at 11 a.m. next Wednesday, the 2nd of December. The topic is film and social action. We've got a great lineup of speakers, including filmmaker Ken Loach. So it should be a really fascinating discussion. Do please join us. Again, you can find out more about uh, this on the Cumberland Lodge website. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you especially to Stanley and Paul for such a fan fantastic and fascinating conversation and for responding so, so fully to all the questions that we've had. So thank you both very much indeed. You're very welcome. It's a great pleasure, Ed, and, and we wish Cumberland Lodge extremely well. Such a of wonderful course. place and everything that it does. Thank you. That's very kind of you. And all, it's, all that's left for me to say now is give me leave now to leave thee. Now, the melancholy God protect thee, and the tailor make thy doublet of changeable taffeta, for thy mind is a very opal. I would have men of such constancy put to sea, that their business might be everything and their intent everywhere, for that's it that always makes a good voyage of nothing. Farewell. Let all the rest give place. In other words, goodbye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.